Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 10th seminar of the search and matching in macro and finance virtual seminar series. So today we are very happy to have Ben Lester from uh, Philadelphia Fed as our speaker. Uh, before Ben uh, starts the uh, talk, uh, let me make a, a couple of announcements. So our upcoming workshop is going to be about the economics of digital currencies. Uh, it's going to start uh, uh, on Wednesday and it's going to be a, a three morning uh, type uh, workshop. It is uh, jointly organized with Rutgers University, Bank of Canada and, and Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. And in addition to that, in November, we are going to have a workshop for uh, job market candidates. So basically, uh, you can go to our website to learn about the details. And the deadline is in one week. So if you are interested in submitting uh, submitting your work or making an announcement to your students, etc., please check our website. So on the screen, you are seeing uh, our standard format and the excellent list of panelists we have. So it is typical, we are going to have a 60 minute talk uh, and during the talk, only panelists are going to be able to ask questions. But after the talk, we are going to have a 15 minute live Q&A uh, in which uh, everybody from the uh, attendees can ask uh, questions by raising hand. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to let Ben uh, share the screen and, and start the talk. Now it's telling me I can't share the screen. You're sharing your First, screen. Maybe I should There stop. you go. Yeah. All right. Now let's try here. Okay. So can everybody see my slides? All right. Yes. So first of all, guys, thanks for having me uh, for the search of matching seminar here. Great to uh, great to see some familiar faces on the screen. This is joint work with with David and Giorgio, who are on the call and are happy to uh, you know take your your, your questions in the Q&A box, so just fire away with those guys. Uh, since Giorgio and I uh, work at the Fed, I need to start with, with this screen, just saying that these are our views and not those of, of the Fed system. So I want to jump right in because uh, we have a lot uh, that I want to tell you about today. Uh, so, you know, like many of the people uh, on the call here, uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how people get jobs. So what are the frictions inherent in the matching process between workers and firms? What kind of technologies and institutions have arisen over time to try and overcome these frictions? And ultimately, what are the effects on, on the labor market outcomes we care about? Wages, match quality, output, tenure, turnover, things like that. So when you go to the data and you start to look at the few surveys out there that, that, that try to capture how people get jobs, Something that jumps out at you almost immediately is that in a large number of matches, uh, depending on whether the, the worker or the firm side is surveyed, um, people cite this idea of referrals being widely used in the hiring process. So the number ranges from somewhere between about a third to as much as 60%, depending on how the question is asked and who exactly is asked. So given my interest uh, in the topic and, and seeing that referrals seem to be so widely used, you know, the natural next question to me is, you know, what are, what are these referrals doing? Uh, so, you know, what frictions are they helping to overcome in the market? And is using referral somehow affecting wages, tenure, turnover? If so, how much? Um, so somewhat surprisingly to me, at least, uh, I think it's fair to say that despite the prevalence of referrals uh, being used in the hiring process, there's not really a consensus in the literature on exactly what they do. So on the empirical side, even facts as, as you know, you might think as simple as a question like, you know, do referred workers make higher or lower starting wages? So, you know, you can find a bunch of, of papers that say higher, a bunch of papers that say lower and, and all sorts of things in between. And it seems to us that, that one of the big obstacles in, in understanding some of the empirical patterns is, is the data. So, so, so first, you know, there just really aren't that many data sets that contain detailed information about how people actually get their jobs. Um, and among those that actually do exist, they're, for the most part, not really representative. So there are a few data sets. You know, Giorgio has a very nice paper where they, where they have clean data, but from a single firm. 
there are a couple of nice papers that have come out recently that have data from one or a very select number of industries or that, that there are older papers that have uh, data on referrals within a certain population, like within the Hispanic population. But overall, there's, there's not a clear set of uh, stylized facts about what, what referrals do coming out of the empirical literature. Now, alongside uh, this empirical literature, and, and, and maybe because of, of the mixed nature of the empirical literature, there's a bunch of different theories that have been written down uh, to try and understand what referrals do. And, and these theories are based on, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of ideas that seem somewhat reasonable. You know, some, some theories are based on the idea that, 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 uh, that referrals are a way around, you know, spatial or search frictions. It's, it's hard to put, you know, an ad in the paper and go out and, and find people. But, you know, if someone who works at the firm knows somebody, you can sort of circumvent that costly search. There's a bunch of theories about information frictions, whether, uh, whether referrals create better matches under, you know, symmetric uncertainty, whether they, they kind of reduce adverse selection problems, you know, reduce the chance that a firm is going to hire a lemon, uh, there's moral hazard theories, there's all these things, but it's kind of hard uh, to assess which of these is, is kind of the most important, um, in part because the ambiguity in the data, uh, and moreover, I mean, it's really hard to get a, a quantitative sense uh, about which of these sort of channels is, is most relevant. So, so what are we going to do in this paper? Uh, so we're going to exploit a relatively new data set that, that, that Giorgio and, and Jason and Aisha Gul and Andy Miller helped to design, which is a job search supplement to the survey of consumer expectations that, that, that's uh, administered by the New York Fed. So for those of you who don't know this data set, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's, it's, it's really nice. And, and I kind of feel like there's a trove of information available there. It's publicly available. And for our purposes, there's two really nice features about this data set. Uh, the first is that there's in fact very detailed information about how workers try to get jobs. In fact, how do they try to get offers, not just jobs and the resulting outcomes. So what kind of offers they get what kind of jobs they take and, and the characteristics of those jobs. And the second feature uh, that, I, that I cited as an impediment on the previous slide is that the sample itself is a fairly representative sample of workers across demographics, occupations, so on and so forth. So using this data, our first key contribution is gonna to be to establish that, yes, if you, if you kind of went back and did a lot of the statistical analysis that had been done in previous papers, you would in fact see fairly ambiguous relationships between the use of referrals and labor market outcomes. However, uh, we find that once we're able to make a distinction along two dimensions of the data, that's, that's relatively unexplored. You wouldn't really be able to do this in, in most other data sets. Uh, actually, we see very, I think I'm gonna try and convince you, we see very clear at significant relationships between the use of referrals and labor market outcomes. And, and those dimensions, I think once I say them are gonna be fairly obvious, um, but, but maybe weren't so obvious ex ante. Uh, so the first dimension that we're able to, uh, to distinguish between is the source of the referral. So whether the person who referred you to a particular job was in one bucket that we're gonna call family and friend, and in another bucket that we're gonna call business contact, I'll tell you exactly how we formulate these buckets in a few slides. But the idea very simply is that, you know, you might imagine there's, there's just a little bit of a difference between, uh, you know, a referral from Uncle Joey uh, and a referral from your former supervisor at your job. Um, and the second dimension of the data that turns out to be really important for understanding the patterns is the type of job. So the, the, we're gonna have, come up with a way to sort of rank jobs by the skill or the educational requirements or the occupation. And that's gonna be important too. So it's not just that there's a difference between a referral from Uncle Joey and, and your advisor, but it's a difference between those referrals if you're trying to get a job flipping burgers or if you're you know, trying to get a job uh, as a neurosurgeon. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, there's going to be this data part of the presentation today, and, I, and I'm going to try very hard to, to convince you that in order to really understand the relationship between referrals and labor market outcomes, I want you to think carefully about these two dimensions of the, uh, of the data. So that'll be the first part of the talk. Now, hopefully I don't have to argue too hard uh, in this crowd. 
uh, the following point, but, but at the end of the day, the data is going to show us a bunch of statistical relationships, uh, you know, between, between objects that, you know, there is going to be sort of rife with, with all the usual issues of selection and endogeneity and stuff like that. And so in order to kind of interpret um, what's really going on and, and, and the role that, that referrals are actually playing, we're going to try to use a, we're, we're going to try to write down a structural model that uh, is, is a pretty standard model along a lot of dimensions. So it's, it's going to look like a fairly typical job search, uh, kind of, la I guess, a job ladder model. But uh, we're going to try to incorporate multiple channels of search into, into the standard model. So once we do this, we're going to solve the model. We're going to calibrate the model. That's going to deliver to us some, I think, some some pretty interesting patterns in the, uh, or, or features of of the what, what's going to end up being the matching technology. That's going to allow us to to put put a name to what kind of uh, matching technologies do we need to match the data that uh, to match the patterns we see in the data in our data set. In particular, we're going we're gonna to be able to kind of isolate novel estimates of how different channels of finding a job, so we're getting referred through a business contact, getting referred through family and friends, or going through more formal channels. Uh, our analysis is basically going to show uh, how often these types of opportunity arrive, so the frequency of the arrival rate and the potential match quality of, of, of matches formed through these different channels, both across different types of workers and across different types of occupations. Using this uh, calibrated model, then we kind of have a laboratory to try and do some uh, quantitative analysis to try and you know, isolate uh, some of the implications of referrals for outcomes that, that we might care about more broadly. Uh, so uh, one of the ones that, that I'm going to emphasize today is, is one of the decompositions we do where we ask the question, for example, suppose I take a worker uh, in a low skill occupation, you know, we're going to decompose the value of that worker, say network of family and friends to his overall earnings. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for, for business contacts. And we could think about this in, you know, across different types of workers and low and high skill um, occupations. So, you know, why is this interesting? Well, you know, you might think that it'd be interesting to understand uh, you know, if I move from my hometown to a different location, what are the expected losses in my earnings due from the fact that I'm kind of forfeiting my, my uh, network of family and friends who help me get jobs? Or if I decide tomorrow that I don't want to be an economist anymore, that I want to be a, a pipe fitter, um, you know, and I give up uh, the network of all you lovely people that I've developed over the years, you know, what's that going to cost me in terms of my earnings? Uh, and so we're going to do a couple other counterfactuals as well. I hope we I hope we get to it. So, so that's kind of the paper uh, that I, I'm going to present in three different sections. The first part is going to be a bunch of data work where I'm going to try to convince you we have some some new and interesting facts. We're going to go fairly quickly through the model since since it's mostly standard with a few new twists, and then uh, I'll spend some time on on the calibration and the quantitative exercise trying to convince you we we found some important things in the data. Um, let me just flash this literature slide very quickly. The only point I want to make here in the interest of time is that there are a bunch of papers that I'll call mostly empirical. What I mean by that is some of these papers have, have models, but they're primarily uh, toy models to explain you know, one direction or another uh, of, of, the, of the data that they're seeing. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, you know, mostly theory papers. These are papers where the, the primary object of interest is the model. And they may match, uh, you know, designed to match one or two stylized facts. But, but there's very few papers that, that, that are, you know, sort of uh, at least, you know, semi-series modeling exercise that are designed to fit, uh, fit the data well. And, and the first one I have here is this, this very nice paper by, by David Wixer and his co-authors. If you haven't read it, uh, it came out in the IER in 2019. I, I highly recommend it. There are two other working papers, but our paper is going to fit into this into this third group here. Papers that try to, you know, develop both data and model at the same time. So, let me start with the data. So, as I mentioned, this is uh, data coming from the job search supplement to the survey of consumer expectations. Uh, we have, I guess, what is that, five or six years of data. Um, I mentioned before, it captures a wide cross section of the population. 
and occupations. The job search supplement uh, is, is a, a supplement that goes out once a year um, to, to each wave of the SCE. The typical wave of the SCE is about 1,300 participants. And what it does, it collects detailed information on both the employment status and the job search behavior of the workers in the, in the sample. So for those workers that are currently employed, we're gonna have great data on their occupation, the wages, their hours, benefits, even, even things like, like job satisfaction. And we have measures of how good the workers feel the fit is between themselves and the firm. Um, and the other thing that's really important about this data set is they add they ask a lot of questions about the search process that led to the current job. And you know, it's not surprising given who, who wrote these questions, but the, the questions are really written in such a way uh, that, that somebody who has worked on job search models would, would write them to try and understand the, the process. And then for both the employed and unemployed, uh, so if you're employed, they don't stop asking you about your job search behavior. That's gonna be important for us. They also ask a lot of questions about your willingness to accept offers, how many, how many times you were contacted, they ask about your best offer, the, the offer you accepted, uh, so on and so forth. There's also some retrospective uh, stuff where, where you know something about previous employment, previous wages that we're gonna exploit as well. Okay, so you know, lots been doing, uh, being done with this data right now. Let me tell you uh, these two, two key distinctions that I highlighted before. So the first one I told you about was that we're gonna make a, a big deal about the fact that there are different types of referrals. We're gonna call a referral from a family and friend. Uh, that's if, if when the worker is asked how they heard about their current job, they tick a box that says, I was referred by a friend or relative. And the bucket that we're gonna call business contacts, that, that, that's gonna be characterized if you ticked off the box that says, I was referred by a former coworker, supervisor, business associate, or current worker at the firm. Now you'll notice that there can be some overlap. So you know, if your dad works at a firm and he helps you get a job, of course, he's a relative and a current worker at the firm. Uh, so you can uh, potentially have some overlap in these two character, uh, categories. We, we don't see that much of it, in fact. Um, but, but it's possible. Excuse me, Ben. Yeah. How much overlap do you see? I would have thought that most of the, f the relatives and friends would have been current workers at the firm. And so I would have been curious to see whether your results would be stronger if you did uh, referred by friend or relative and then not referred by friend and relative, but referred by business. And whether that dichotomy would have been a stronger dichotomy. So um, I can say this. So, so we struggled a little bit uh, to what to do with current worker at the firm. Right. And so we did that uh, five different ways where we allowed, you know, we called it a friend or relative if it was both friend and current worker at the firm or we separate. It didn't ultimately matter that much. And I think that's because there weren't that many that overlapped. I, I don't remember exactly. I haven't looked. I want to say less than definitely less than 10% overlap, more, more, oh, that's more surprising. close to five. Yeah, um, and, and we can do to... more. I can talk maybe in the discussion a little bit more later. We even have, they even ask finer details uh, in terms of whether the person who referred you was at your level above, below. And so, so we can, when they were a current worker at the firm. Um, so I can get into a little bit of that later. Okay. Um, but if it's okay, I'll delay that for now. And, and Thank show you. you what I've got. Um, so these are the two different types of referrals that I that I want to make clear. Um, ben, yeah. can I ask um, a question? Yeah. Um, so um, would it be correct to think of the second cat category, the former co-worker, etc., as being people who are uh, sort of in the same field, um, sort of the same occupation as the job that you end up getting, while the first group, the friend and relative, might be a little bit more um, heterogeneous uh, in yes. terms of the correlation between the referrer and the and the job of the person who's referred i think that's yeah i think that's reasonable yeah and and, and as we see the data we can come back to that and, and and try to tie that into some of the stories uh about about whether we think that makes sense but i would say yes um okay so those are different types of referrals hopefully those are fairly clear then we also want to think about different types of jobs with the idea, of course, in the back of our head that the frictions inherent, say, in the econ job market uh, are probably very different uh, than the kind of frictions uh, that the guys who are actually mowing my lawn right now face when they're trying to find somebody to, uh, to join the crew. 
So the way that we're going to do it is to borrow an index from the sociology literature called the Nam Powers Boyd Index. It's not really that important how they how they construct this exactly. It's based on the average education and income within that three-digit occupation code. Uh, we actually constructed our own measure using ONET that the results didn't really change. Just to make everybody feel warm and fuzzy inside, uh, what I did here is I, I just put together, a, this is at the aggregate at the two-digit occupation code. So, so when we do the statistical analysis, everything's going to be done at, at a finer three-digit occupation code. But I just wanted to flash this on the screen to give you an idea of, you know, what gets in, the, in this NPB index, what gets a high score and a low score. So people who do food prep and buildings and grounds, you know, they have a low score, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle uh, is your secretary. And then at the high, uh, higher end are, uh, you know, architects, engineers, mathematicians, and I don't know, maybe it's not such a good thing because lawyers look like they're at the top, but, um, but you get a rough idea of, of how this is going to work. And again, this is all at the two digit occupation. If you actually look more carefully, you know, legal occupations is broken down into lawyers who have an even higher score and paralegals who have a lower score, things like that. Okay. Let's get to some facts. So Ben, just a yeah. quick question. Uh, yeah. So it's clarifying, probably, maybe you've said it already. Do you see, uh, what do you see re related to the dynamics of referral? So do you see the same worker several times in the survey? And if not, no. do you see? Uh, so in general, no, right? So they're in the survey. The worker has been at given occupation? Or yeah, so every, design? yeah. So this is a limitation of what we do. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, uh, how we try to deal with it. But people are in the survey of consumer expectations for a year, but the, uh, the job search supplement don't, is only done once. Um, so we might have some information about them uh, from things that are collected at a monthly basis from the SCE, but a lot of the uh, questions specific to job search, uh, they only answer once. Um, that being said, they are retrospective, right? So if you've been, you could be employed for, for five years now, but they're still going to say, how did you find your, your current job? Um, so we have, the, to the extent there's some dynamics there, but no, but we don't have a repeated panel of workers over time, which is something that would be super nice. The worker give a sense of their job history. So, you know, if they've been yeah, so lawyer for a very long know, time long, versus not. There's information on how long, uh, you know, you've been currently employed. There's information on the job search that led to your current employment. And there's information on uh, your previous job. And uh, if I may interject quickly, yeah, so we have information about the work history for the prior five years, you know, so over the last five years, how long you've been employed, how long you've been out of a job. Um, and as Ben said, you know, the characteristics of the prior job, prior wage and so on. So we, we have a fair amount of information, even though it's a cross section. Okay, so I'm taking too long. I just realized, so let, let me get into it. So the first fact that I'm going to show you, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at all currently employed workers and you know each of them is going to answer how they got their current job and so what i'm going to plot here is i'm going to plot the fraction of currently employed workers who report using either a referral from a business contact or a referral from a family and friend and i'm going to plot that against this this uh skill index or this occupation uh, index that i just talked about so on the left-hand side, uh, we have the plot for family and friends. And so what I think comes out pretty clearly from this plot is that the fraction of workers who report using a referral from family and friends is relatively higher at low skill jobs and relatively lower at high skill jobs. Whereas the business contacts have more or less the exact opposite pattern. So referrals from business contacts appear to be used less frequently at low skill jobs and more frequently at high skill jobs. So these are just the raw unconditional plots. You know, we run some regressions controlling for things like age, race, sex, marital status, children. Giorgio one always wants to include home ownership, so that's in there. Um, and so the, the regressions confirm uh, what you see in the plots, which is a weaker positive relationship between the use of business referrals uh, in the, the skill index of the occupation and a, and a stronger negative relationship between, uh, between the use of referrals from family and friends. And, and so, okay, so that's just a little bit of a summary. Ben, but, you know, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Sure, yeah. uh, um, I'm gonna fight for it. Aren't ahead, you surprised Ron. by the levels that even in the most advanced occupations, 
friends and family still appear to be like if you just think about the econ job market a reference from your uncle we wouldn't take that seriously at all unless he is a nobel prize winner i guess but but i like it just seems yeah that... i i mean i we have to i mean i I, I think our, our profession is fairly unique. Uh, you know, I think I, I think in the legal profession, I don't think it's that odd that uh, you know uh, you come out of Harvard Law and one of your best buddies happens to work at the firm that you get uh, hired at. Um, you know, I, in that sense, I think that that our profession might not be representative. But yeah, I mean, your point is well taken. And I have another question. Ben, I was going to ask about endogeneity here and, and wondering what you guys are going to do it, with it both here and maybe in the model. Um, you know, the unobserved heterogeneity is probably a big reason for, for joint workers jointly being stuck in low wage jobs and also jointly using more um, referrals from family than from business associates. All right. So All right. can I just say wait? Sure. Okay. Because the answer is yes. Okay. So, so unobserved heterogeneity is going to play a huge role and, and people selecting into these sort of different outcomes is going to be exactly how the, 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 the sort of course we take. So for the empirical stuff, do you guys, do you guys look at this by maybe controlling for the five-year work history or prior wages or anything along those lines? I promise I'm going to show you. Okay. Hey, quick, quick question, Ben. Do you see, do you see firm information, like firm size? Uh, we data? see firm size in broad buckets, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, thanks. All right, so that I, so so that I, I don't let Faberman keep keep jumping too far ahead. Let me keep going. Let me just say here that that you know when we first started looking at this, this immediately made us think that okay maybe maybe these are just two different objects: a referral from a family and friend and a referral from business context. So let's go and revisit some of these facts that have been looked at in the data. Uh, so the first fact is, is you know do referred workers or rep uh, workers who report finding their job through referral. Uh, earn different starting wages, okay? So in the first column here, what we've done is we've just run a, a regression of log real starting wages with dummies on whether you report using a business referral or family and friend, controlling for time and region fixed effects and controlling for all the individual controls I mentioned before. And so what I think jumps out quite starkly is that there are large and very significant positive effects. So those who report using a business referral to get their job appear to have considerably higher starting wages. And those who use family and friends report having uh, lower starting wages. Now, of course, we, we also want to control for the occupation. We can do that in a number of different ways, literally down to controlling for the actual occupation code. Sorry, ben, yeah. Yeah, so just one clarification. So we should think of it as, uh, this as being if, relative to the group of workers who get their job without relative any referral. Relative to non -referred. Yes, okay. I should have said yeah, that. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so if we control for, for occupation, the skill index, um, the, the effect on the business referral remains about the same. The effect on family and friends is, is still fairly large and, and negative, but, but uh, about half. And then getting to Jason's question from a minute ago. So, you know, there is this question, this relates to Pierre's question as well, about unobservable heterogeneity uh, across workers. Now, um, you know, to the extent that we, we try to control for that, one thing that you could do is you can control for their previous wage, their old job. Uh, and so when we do this, we still have a large and significant effect on the business referrals, but the effect on family and friends goes away. So, you know, let me try and interpret this in a way that makes sense to me. So the way that I think about this is that to the extent that a starting wage indicates, you know, uh, something about the quality of the match, this is kind of suggesting that 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 those who are get a job through a business referrals are potentially actually better matches. Whereas those who are getting jobs through family and friends, and this is exactly, I think, where Jason was going, it's not necessarily that if you get a job through a family and friend that it's a worse job. It just might be that the folks who needed a family member or friend to help them get the job for other reasons that are not observable might in general have, have lower starting wages. The last thing I want to show you on the wage thing here is that if we were not able to make this distinction between the two types of referrals, so if I was just regressing whether you used any referral on log starting wages, uh, we would see nothing in the data. So Ben, so, this so, is the point where I thought that if you had taken the people who were recommended by family out of the business, 
that 10% or whatever, that this, the result might have been stronger and they might have been more clearly different. So the idea is that you have it, in the business referrals. We didn't see it referrals. in the data, though. You don't see, if you took those people out, it wouldn't yeah. make this a stronger relationship. No, I mean, I, like, I, I mean, we could talk more about, I, I mean, we can literally just go run exactly the specification you want, but we spent days trying yeah. a million No, I'm just talking about taking a slightly different definition of uh, business, which take out the people who were family. And no, that's friends. what I'm saying. That's exactly what we did. That's okay. exactly what we did. Uh, and it so, did not, it did not change these results substantially. Okay. I should have thought the business would be more significant then. It might have changed things slightly. Yeah. I think, you know, David probably has those those regressions somewhere on his, his, his desktop right now, but, um, okay. but, Sorry. but uh, yeah, it didn't really change much. And previous week, what do you do for uh, non-employment? Because you could imagine that family and friends is really important for finding a job from sitting on your couch, but for climbing the ladder, business referrals. Uh, right. So, so you'll then, notice here that we lose some some observations when we include previous wage. Um, so one thing we were careful to do is then go back and run these exact regressions only on the 2,600 or 2,676 workers who had a previous wage, uh, and the results were unchanged there as well. Uh, ben, just uh, one question in terms of uh, these referrals. Do you have any information about referrals and the previous job in terms of no. their... No. I don't believe we know how they got their previous job. Yeah, because uh, I'm... My question here would be in terms of is this, are the referrals uh, or are these business referrals an indication of a better match or just me, an indication me, of a better quality worker? And then if it's a better quality worker, you would imagine, as David said, that these people are moving up the job ladder quite let fast. Me, let, me, let me go on. These are exactly, the, I'm not trying to Okay. Short change here. These are exactly, you're asking all the right questions and that's the whole point that we're going to try and figure out. Okay. Can I just jump in with one more question about that? Of course. Sorry. So for, um, do you also have the number of other job offers they received? Yes. Um, so can you condition on that as well? Because I mean, there must be some positive correlation with the number of offers you receive and whether or not you received a referral from a business contact. That's a good question. I have to go. I, I, yeah, I have to go back and see what we did with that. We're going to exploit that data when we calibrate the model because we're going to be able to match just not not just like E to E transitions, but use data on the offer rate, the rate at which you receive the offers. Um, I can't remember that we actually put some of that stuff into these regressions, but it's a good idea. So so thanks. For that. Uh, ben, okay, so yeah, I want to click on that, and in particular with respect to the referrals from family and friends. The reason mm -hmm. is uh, relating to this whole uh, selection thing. Uh, it seems to me there's a lot of selection on the firm side, which I think some of it you're missing here. And you might know there's this paper of the Review of Economic Studies by Dushman yes. and others, yes. and they run a regression like you run, and they get a negative effect on wages and then they include a firm fixed effect yeah and then the effect on the referrals turns positive yeah so so, so i mean you know there's there's i mean I, I like that paper there's sort of a trade-off when you're comparing the two papers right so they don't really directly observe much about whether anybody was actually uh, referred right they they proxy this by looking at the fraction of people of your own ethnicity that work at the firm right. um but they have rich they have rich uh, data on the firm side so, you know, in contrast, we have kind of much better data on the, on the worker side about exactly who referred you, the type of referral, stuff like that, um, but, but we don't have. So, so we do what we can controlling for uh, firm fixed effects as well, just through firm size, and that didn't change any of our results. But of course, I can't, you know, we can't speak to more than that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so the next thing that we're gonna look at is, is tenure. Uh, I really got to try to speed up a little bit here. Um, you know, let, let me just say that a lot of the theories that people had written down um, derive from sort of an old style Jovanovic style matching model where there's some idiosyncratic uncertainty about a match. But if you come through referral, that, that distribution of that, of that match specific uh, productivity comes from a say, let's say a better distribution. So most of what you would see in existing models is that referred workers, if they earn higher wages, that, that they should stay longer 
because they're in fact better matches. So, so just keep that in the back of your head. Now, just a quick note, I'm not gonna get into the weeds here too much because this is a common problem across a lot of these things, but I just wanna you know, be, be upfront about the fact we don't actually observe many completed spells. So what you really wanna know is the complete tenure uh, of a worker at a firm. Um, we don't observe that. We observe tenure up to the sampling date at which these workers were, were asked. Now, so, so this data is, is, is both left truncated and, and right censored. What I mean by that is on, on the left truncated side, um, a worker who has, for, for, for whatever reason, a lot of short spells is less likely to employ, be employed at the moment that he's asked about this. So then our sample would, would not have these short spell guys. So, so the average of what we observe would be larger than the average of the completed spell. But on the other hand, there's this right censoring. We don't observe the, the total spell, which of course would make what we observe shorter. You know, we know uh, this, is, this goes back to Heckman and Singer and, and older papers. Uh, there, there are specific conditions under which these two biases cancel out that what we're actually gonna measure in the data is, is equal to the, the average of the completed spells. But in our case, it's not actually gonna be super important, right? I'm gonna show you a bunch of facts about what we can observe here, which is tenure up to the sampling date. But what's nice then is I'm gonna to go to a model where I have both of these two objects in the model. Uh, and, so, and so we can look at them more seriously, okay? But everything I'm about to show you now is about what I'm calling T hat here. So, so properties of tenure up to the sampling date. So we do the exact same three regressions here that we did with wages. And what you see immediately is that these guys who got their job through business referrals, they're earning higher wages, but in general, they have shorter tenures. So opposite what a Jovanovic style model would tell you. Whereas the guy who got their job through family and friends, they're earning on average lower wages, uh, but in fact, they're, they're staying longer. And again, if you could not condition between these two distinct types of referrals, you would get a ambiguous, slightly positive uh, relationship between the two. Okay, so this went back to a question I got earlier. So, you know, why do we have workers who are referred through uh, business contacts? They're earning high wages, but they appear to be leaving quickly. Those who are referred through family and friends, they tend to have relatively low wage relative to the non-referred, but they're staying longer. You could come up with, a, I think, uh, a dozen different reasons. A few, uh, two of the ones that kind of struck us as, as most likely originally was, you know, one of the first ideas I had is that it might be the case that family and friends are good at matching you with jobs uh, that are good matches along non-pecuniary channels. So, you know, uh, you need a job that, that's close to your house or, or flexible because you have to take care of, of your kid uh, and family and friends help you find that. It might not be reflected in the wage, but it's a good fit. And, and then the other story we had in our head is that maybe there's a correlation between whatever you use to get your current job and the arrival rate of, of future offers. So, so just more generally, something that, that we thought was, was a bit missing with, with the exception of, of very few papers, including uh, I guess David's paper would be one of the exceptions, is people thought a lot about how referrals might help you get a job, but then somehow whatever helped you get that job seemed to evaporate the second you got the job. And we didn't wanna think that way. We wanted to think that whatever helped you get this job might actually continue to help, get, help you get jobs in the future. So uh, very quickly, because I'm going to try and speed up, what I'm going to show you is that it's not really the first one. Um, we have very good uh, measures of job satisfaction, where the survey asks questions about how, how satisfied are you overall? Um, how well do you think the job fits your experience and skills? Uh, what are the opportunities like? How satisfied are you with other aspects of the job? When we run these regressions against these, these usage of business and family referrals, we just really don't see anything. Uh, on the other hand, when we go and look at the contact rate of workers who got their current job through business or family and friends and see, have they been contacted, for example, in the last four weeks, what we find is that the guys who got their job through, current job through a business contact tend to continue to get jobs more quickly in the future, whereas the guys who got their current job through family and friends have a lower contact rate. Uh, than, than the non-referred. So, ben, yeah. one, just one quick question on the magnitudes on these, uh, these last numbers. So if you kind of use those coefficients in a very simple you know, duration model, do they add up to the coefficients you found in the previous uh, exercise? Yes, they are consistent, yes. Okay, so, and, and so it actually, seems like this is- further with that because one thing I didn't mention here is that a different way to tell if somebody is satisfied 
is if they report also looking for a job currently. And we actually found that 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 these guys weren't looking for jobs, that these were coming through actually um, what we call unsolicited offers. So so you can actually measure in the data whether people were, were looking for offers or where it kind of came out of, out of nowhere. Um, so we also tried to track that down as well. So the okay, so contact rates do seem to explain all of the variation in the in the tenure um, in tenure across these uh, referral types. So what's going to what be saying. nice? I'm going to put you off a little bit because what's going to be nice is when I go to the model, I'm going to have a lot of discipline on the fact that I'm going to have to match the con simultaneously. I'm going to have to match the contact rate, which we observe in the data, the E to E rate, which we observe, the usage of these different channels, and the tenures. That, that arise through these different channels all at the same time. So the, the, the kind of consistency you're asking for it has got to be there. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, so let me just kind of, uh, oof, turn this off. okay. So let me just kind of summarize the main empirical finding here. We've, we've documented that referrals and family and friends tend to be used more frequently at low skill jobs. They're associated with lower starting wages and longer job tenure, despite no significant difference in job satisfaction. Whereas the referrals from business contact tend to be used more frequently at high skill jobs. They're associated with higher starting wages, but shorter tenure. And that seems to arise because of more outside offers. And that failing to distinguish between these two types of referrals reveals these ambiguous results. So I think that's nice that it also kind of helps us understand why you might have gotten conflicting empirical evidence in older studies if you happen to have had data from a firm uh, at a low skill occupation, given that the, the fraction of people using family and friends or business contacts in that firm is quite different than if you had data from a different occupation, a high skill occupation, you would actually expect to see systematic differences in the regressions that you're running. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the model now. So, you know, uh, when I presented this before, sometimes people ask, you know, why, why a model? I, I alluded to this earlier, so I, I'll be somewhat brief here. But, you know, what we have so far is statistical relationships that immediately, as, as Jason and others point out, there's all sorts of endogeneity, there's all sorts of selections. And what we really want to do is understand what are the, what are the, the types of mechanisms, what are the types of patterns in the usage of these different um, job search methods that help us understand what's really going on. And, and, and to take it one step further, I think it's, it's kind of easy, and I'm sure most people in the audience right now have a theory in their head of like, oh, this is all X or Y. But it's really, uh, I'm gonna argue, a lot more challenging uh, to come up with a consistent theory that, that is consistent across all these different um, dimensions at the same time, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Okay, so we're gonna try and write down a model the model, as I mentioned, is going to try to insert multiple job search channels into an otherwise standard uh, job ladder model. We're going to try to do it in a fairly parsimonious but flexible way to kind of capture what are the real relationships uh, that we need to see uh, between these objects that we don't get to see, which is, say, the arrival rate of meetings, the quality of matches across uh, different job search channels. Um, and then once we get these estimates, we're going to be able to explore the aggregate implications and some of the counterfactuals I talked about before. Okay, so as I mentioned, we want a model that's kind of rich enough to, to match the data, but simple enough to determine. So, you know, the key features of the data that I just highlighted were that people use different job search methods. It appears that some of these are, are used more or less intensely by different types of workers and that they get used both before and after you find a job. So guided by these kind of very simple observations are gonna be the three key ingredients of our model. One, there's gonna be a bunch of different ways to find a job. There's gonna be multiple channels by which you meet firms. We're gonna allow those channels to also affect the quality of the match. There's gonna be the unobservable heterogeneity that Faberman wanted to see that potentially interacts with both the arrival rate that you meet firms and the quality of the match and we're gonna allow for search on and off the job. So I'm gonna go a little bit quick here uh, because of the audience uh, and, and just say up front that, that this is essentially gonna be a textbook, you know, postal vinay roban style model. In fact, uh, I'm gonna use the Kahook postal vinay roban version of, of wage determination. 
And I'm just going to you know, go a little bit more slowly at the spots that, that we modify the model. But overall, for those of you who are familiar with that model, this is going to be right up the middle. So we're going to have a measure of workers with some unobservable heterogeneity. I'm going to call that heterogeneity the AI, and I'm going to sometimes call that, that a worker's ability. Um, and we're going to have some distribution over um, th this, this unobservable heterogeneity, which is going to be denoted by pi. Uh, as in these, most of these job ladder models, firms are, are not that interesting. Uh, there's a large measure of these firms that operate a constant returns to scale production technology. So here's, here's the new bit. Uh, the new bit is that workers and firms can potentially meet through two, three, three different channels, sorry. And this is all going to be exogenous to the model here. Um, so we're going to have three channels, B, F, and O. B is going to stand for a business referral. F is going to stand for a referral from a family and friend, and O is going to stand for other or formal. Uh, you can think of it as a sort of the more uh, formal search market, uh, but F was taken by family, so we used O. So we're, we're going to have these two objects, these, these lambda J of A's. They're going to differ whether you're employed or unemployed, as usual. But this is going to be the arrival rate for, let's say, an unemployed worker with ability A the arrival rate of offers that come through channel J, which is business, family, and friends, or other. And then conditional on meeting a firm, worker and the firm are going to draw a match for certificate productivity X. That's going to be drawn from a distribution that also can potentially depend on both the channel and the worker's underlying type. So this is the sense in which, you know, we're going to have a fairly flexible specification, we've, we've admittedly sort of taken out the decisions of which, which channel the worker wants to use, um, but we're going to allow uh, your underlying type to affect both the arrival rate of offers and the, and the match specific quality, uh, productivity of, of the match. Ben? If you, yes. Why, why, why did you decide to remove all, you know, ex ante heterogeneity on the firm side? I mean, it, it, Given that you mentioned uh, okay, the fact that you know, workers climb the job ladder and, and et cetera, that. Um, oh, okay. All right. I was going to, let me answer a slightly different question first, and then I'll come back to you. So, so the first thing that I want to answer is that I want you to think, so, so, so each market, you know, each version of our model, each equilibrium I solve for, I want to think about a specific market. Okay. So, uh, so, so there's going to be a, a production technology, which, which you can see here is just a linear production technology. Um, and so I want you to think of a, of a single equilibrium of this model as the market for lawyers or the market for burger flippers. And, uh, and then this, this I, cause I just don't want to confuse anyone. This unobservable heterogeneity is about some underlying type. So there are going to be good burger flippers and bad burger flippers, good lawyers and bad lawyers. Um, so that is in a sense, I'm not going to have a model where people move across occupations. We're all going to think about uh, within, you know, a labor market is within an occupation. Now your question was, why don't I have heterogeneity within a, so, so good law firms and bad law firms? Um, you know, from working with these models a little bit, I don't necessarily think that that would be, that would change uh, much here. I guess some of it was guided by the data in the sense that I don't have great data on the firm side. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, maybe, maybe we should think about that one a little bit more. Hey, Ben. Yeah. Did you say? Uh, did you say you guys are not going to model the the choice, the search choice, which method the the workers choose? Yeah. So everything here is going to come through selection. Because you could have also thought that that you you would have an interaction between selection and and search choice. So for example, the low A types would know that um, it's just going to be they're just going to have a very low offer yield for a regular search channel, for example, and then yeah. maybe the match productivity they get for the business channels just going to not lead to you know any decent wage. So the friends and family channel is the only one that works for them in the equilibrium. So, so, so things along those lines, I would have thought you would want to maybe characterize the the search process because of, they would reflect different costs yeah. conditional on their types. No, no. So it's a fair point. So, so. Let me just state uh, a little bit more generally the, I guess, the sort of philosophical approach here. So, so what I, what I want to do at the end of the day, I'm going to get to the calibration in a minute, is say, in order to match these, you know, whatever we have, 13, 14 moments that we have in the data, uh, and, and be 
consistent across usage, wages, tenure, all this stuff. These are the matching patterns we need to see. And, and I'm going to take that as, as, as sort of the, the, the important first step to say, now we can start talking about different mechanisms that are going to generate those matching patterns. So you might have in your head a story about workers' decisions to endogenously invest in different types of networks or whether to try and exploit existing networks, okay? So you're going to go and write down a model that has, that's a network model and, and, and there's some choice over whether you want to try and use one channel versus another, right? Uh, somebody else might have a theory, uh, one of my preferred theories that I'll talk about a little bit later, is this might be about you have a fixed network, but what are the incentives of the people who are going to refer you? So does your uncle have the same incentive to refer you as your, your graduate school advisor? Uh, there, you know, there's all sorts of theories. So then we, uh, you know, we can start doing that game. But the first thing I just want to say is what do these things, what shapes, what patterns do these things need to have for us to have a, a shot? And, and right off the bat, I think I'm going to convince you that some of the theories in the data just have no shot, that they're going yeah, to, they're going to push I was them. thinking just kind of, you know, relating to your original facts, one, one of the facts that seems to stand out that, that you're going to want to explain is that, you know, why are people using the friends and family channel when it gives you lower wages than, than traditional search, right? Yeah. The baseline was traditional search. And the most logical thing I could think of is, is traditional search is just more costly or the returns to the traditional search is just lower for them and you kind of multiply off the rate of the cost. So well, at least from the from the CPS everybody says they do everything. Yeah, I mean that's that's all I mean, especially with family and friends, my, my take was always like there's I don't know if there's much cost for asking uh, family and friends for help. But Ben one other question. Yeah, Why sure. is it that you think that the productivity depends on whether it's business referral or, or family and friends? So, so, so let In me be a front and say- the ability? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so let me be a front. I mean, so, so this would be, you know, th this allows me to capture a bunch of these theories, right? So if you believe that what business referrals do, so, so when you read letters from, uh, you know, from your colleagues uh, for job market mm -hmm. candidates, if you believe that what that does is by reading those letters, you're, you're, you're able to get a better draw on the match specific productivity that if you... But wouldn't that be the A, wouldn't that be captured by the A? Yeah, so, so that's in there, right? So, so in there, so, but yeah, but, I wonder but, but wait, why no, 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 but wait, but wait. So let's say there's a great a job, chain. there's a, no, 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 but there's a great job market candidate out there. And I mm -hmm. give you a letter from his grandma and from his advisor. I'm allowing for the match specific productivity to depend on whether the letter came from grandma or advisor. Right. Now, now we now might I was find- I thinking it would be whether the guy is, is really type A0 or type A1. No, but that's why both are arguments, right? They're both in, okay. I'm, I'm allowing for both and I'm gonna let the data tell me what the shape of that object needs to be. Fair enough. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. hey, sorry to interrupt. Uh, ben, you have 10 minutes. So. Okay. So Ben, just uh, one, oh, one thing about, okay, go ahead. About, <laughs> about Jason's question. Uh, since you have the calibration later on, you can just show us what's the value of increasing search intensity exactly uh, in yep. one or the other uh, search exactly. uh, activity. And probably it's going to uh, answer directly the intuition that uh, exactly. Jason put forward. Okay. So you all know how this works, or maybe you don't, but I'm going to go through it quickly anyway. So we do this game by Kahuk, Postavide, Roban. How does this game work? If I'm unemployed and I meet a firm, there's some surplus and we bargain over the surplus where beta is the worker share of the surplus. Now, what about a, an employed worker who's currently at a, work, a firm where he has wage W, he has productivity X, and he meets a new firm. So this is, you know, Pierre Olivier is sitting at, at UCLA there. So he, he gets an offer from, you know, West Kentucky State University. He goes to the chair, nothing happens, okay? So it's not a good enough offer uh, to generate a, even a counter offer from UCLA. Uh, then, he, you know, the next possibility is that the, the offer is good, but not enough to make Pierre move, but at least he can negotiate with the dean now with the outside option of moving uh, to the most that this, this new, uh, university would pay him. And lastly, you know, Pierre gets, gets a Harvard offer, 
he's he's off, uh, but uh, and, he, and he bargains with with Harvard uh, with the outside option of staying at UCLA with the maximum that UCLA is going to pay. Okay, so um, there's a bunch of objects that you have to solve for in these types of models. Uh, the distribution of unemployed workers across ability, the distribution of employed workers across ability and, and match specific uh, productivity, and then the distribution of wages. What's beautiful about these models is that they turn out to be very tractable. And this is something uh, that I also learned a lot working with, with Pierre Olivier on some of these search models of asset markets, that at the end of the day in these models, the flows are fairly mechanical. So, so they have a little bit of a feature of, of a physics problem. And so what you're doing in the asset market world, you know, Pierre, Semi, you guys know this, you're following assets across asset holders, which is basically a stochastic process that has different jump times to different uh, you know, states. And we have a lot of math that helps us solve those things. The same is true in these job ladder models. You're following workers across different states and, uh, and, you, and you can do a lot by hand. And in particular, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out these objects, these gammas here on the, uh, on the screen. So this, this gamma J of X given A. So this is what is the arrival rate of offers uh, or meetings that yield a match specific productivity larger than X given a worker of type A through channel J. And what's kind of nice is once you aggregate to this capital, this gamma here that I'm highlighting, so this is the only object you need to solve Kahuk post of an a band. Once you have that, you basically follow their, their derivation step by step. You get wages, you get the thresholds, you get the equilibrium distributions, you get them all by hand. And what's nice about that is it's very straightforward at that point to derive all the usual kind of model implied moments, the unemployment rate, the EDE rate, blah, 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 blah. What's nice is that we also get a couple, uh, what I call here the, the, the new kids on the block. So I can derive uh, fairly straightforwardly by hand, the measure of workers of type A who are in a match with productivity X who got their job through channel J. And once I have this, now I can go and calculate by hand all the targets that I presented in the data in the first half of the presentation. So this, I, I can calculate what fraction of workers use channel J. I can calculate the expected wage of workers who are currently matched in a job through channel J, so on and so forth. So this is nice for us. It gives us some intuition when we actually go to matching the data. It's also nice, not that this should matter for anybody, but we don't have to simulate this model to, to, to calibrate it, which, which makes the time of solving it quite a bit more uh, standard. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, I think I have about six or seven minutes. Let me, let me get to the actual quantitative exercise. So, uh, so again, we're gonna now, we're gonna think about the model as separate markets. So we're gonna split the data into two different markets. The high skill market, we're gonna think about those with a bachelor's degree or more. Low skill market, we're gonna think about everybody else. In each market, I'm gonna take a couple of the parameters from outside of the model. Uh, so I'm going to take the value of unemployment from outside the model. I'll talk later about exactly how I do that. Uh, it turns out that's not as big a deal in this model as it is in some of the other models because of the way we parameterize the production function. It's almost a normalization, not quite, but it doesn't matter as much as, you know, we all know that in a lot of those Morton Sintesaridis model, the value of unemployment matters a ton. Um, but, but we're going to have some estimates. Uh, what's nice is that uh, there's a very nice paper by Lise McGeer and Robin. Um, that estimate a very similar model using NLSY uh, data uh, that come up with estimates for the, the worker surplus uh, in a Kahoot post of Roban kind of setting. And they also come up with very precise estimates of the, uh, the relative search efficiency on and off the job. So we're going to steal those. And what we're going to be left with is kind of mostly what's new from our model, which is these, these uh, parameters that govern the arrival rate of matches for a worker of type A through channel J and the quality of matches for workers who match through channel J who are uh, type A. We're also gonna have to parameterize the distribution of the underlying unobserved heterogeneity. We're gonna have two types uh, of unobserved heterogeneity. So think low ability, high ability and, and just a linear production function. So here's how we do um, with, with the calibration, uh, the summary is 
I think we do actually quite well given the large number of moments and the large number of parameters. So uh, we have 13 moments, 13 parameters. The first four moments that we're going to hit here are, are, well, not, sorry, the first three of the first four moments here are fairly standard objects. We're going to hit the unemployment rate, the job destruction rate, and the EDE rate. We're also going to nicely be able to hit the contact rate. So that's going to help us differentially uh, identify uh, differences in the rate at which uh, offers arrive versus the match specific productivity. Uh, the next group of moments are going to be straight from the data I showed you earlier. We're going to match the fraction of workers hired through these different channels. The average log wage of workers hired uh, through different channels. And I'm going to try to nail the differential in the tenure between the workers hired through business ch uh, channel relative to the non-referred and the workers hired through family and friends relative to the non-referred. The last um, the last two moments we're going to uh, will make a little bit more sense in, in a minute, although this is going to make a lot of sense to Wixer because this is basically what these guys do, is the way the model works is going to have very precise predictions about how usage of these different channels changes as you move up and down um, the job ladder, or in, or in other words, as you move up and down uh, the wage distribution. So we're going to target how this differential usage varies we do it between the 75th and 25th percentile of the wage distribution. Okay, so overall the calibration works works quite well. We're comfortable with the with the parameters that are coming out of it. How much time do I have, Semi? Uh, a couple of minutes. But okay. You so can use a few minutes extra. Okay, so so let me show you what what ends up coming out of it. Some of this is going to help uh, with some of the questions Jason asked. So the, I'm just I'm showing you the actual parameter values is not going to help you that much. So this is what I'm showing you here is the arrival rate of offers through these different channels across these different abilities that are X or better. Okay, so on the Y axis is the arrival rate on the on the X axis is the X. So what you see is that amongst the low ability guys, uh, I want you to notice two things. One, the axes are quite different. So in general, low ability guys, for some reason, don't meet firms very frequently or don't match with firms very frequently. But when they do match, you know, both types are going to use other channels more frequently. In the data, about 60% of matches are, are, are made through these other channels, so that, that is going to have to be there. But what I want you to see is the differential ranking between the red and the blue lines across these things. This tells you that low ability guys are relying fairly heavily on referrals from family and friends, whereas the, the better guys, the type A2 guys, almost never need family and friends. They tend to use these business referrals a lot, okay? I, I'm just plotting the exact same figures, but I'm just changing the way that I'm, I'm varying things. So now I'm putting each type on the same graph, just to make this point, right? That the sensitivity of business referrals and other to ability is extremely high, okay? Bad types do not get referred through business contacts. But family and friends are fairly similar, okay? So everybody has an uncle who's willing to make a call for them. But when you reach out to a business contact, if you're no good, you don't, you don't get referred, okay? Uh, the, the picture looks fairly consistent across low and high scale markets. The only thing I want you to take from, from this figure is that the effect is more pronounced in the high scale market than the low, okay? So I, I just, I'm gonna kind of summarize. I'll do my counterfactual and I'll conclude. So the calibrated model is telling you that in equilibrium, these matching uh, patterns have to have three uh, key properties. One is that across types, there has to be significant heterogeneity in the rate at which workers receive offers, okay? So those of you who've been uh, department chair for a while probably know that this is true. There are guys in the department uh, that seem to arrive every year in your office with an offer. And there are people who have been sitting in the corner for 10 years and don't have an offer. Okay, so that's a property of this model that you just have to see. This heterogeneity has to be stemming from difference in the offers they get through their business network and, and other formal channels. It's not coming from family and friends. Okay, so, so, so the family and friends network is kind of used similarly across workers, uh, whereas business and other is very different. And these differences then are more pronounced in the high skill market. The difference between the guys who have offers every year and the guys who don't is more pronounced 
in high skill labor markets than it is. There aren't burger flippers uh, who are much better than the burger flipper next to them. Okay. Um, just real fast so, so, so that you can see how do these properties help generate the facts. The first fact was that workers who got their jobs through business are more likely to be the high types. And the ones who got their job through family and friends are more likely to be the low types. Okay, so, so because of these matching patterns in the data, there's, this is exactly the selection issue that Faberman was, was alluding to five minutes into the talk. If I take a randomly selected worker who got their job through a family, that worker is more likely to be a low type. And then the property number one was that low types match more slowly than high types. So if I see a guy who got hired through family and friends, he's likely to be a low type. Low type don't receive offers very frequently. As a result, they have low wages, but they stay for a long time. When I find a randomly selected worker who got his job through business contact, he's more likely to be a good type. Good types get offers more frequently. Therefore, they have high wages and they have shorter tenures. The fact that this is more pronounced in the high skill market than the low skill market tells us that the business referrals are going to be used more in the high skill market, as I showed you in the first graph, and the family and friends in the low skill. Okay, let me take one minute to just do a, one counterfactual to try to convince you that, that what we're finding has interesting implications above and beyond just learning a little bit about referrals. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take the, the calibrated model. I'm gonna run a simulation. I'm gonna start with a cohort of unemployed workers at T equals zero. I'm gonna simulate the model for 10 years. And then I'm gonna look at the average annual earnings under different scenarios, okay? So the first line in this chart looks at in the benchmark model where all three uh, channels are active. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away the business referrals or the family and friends referrals and see what happens. So what I want you to notice from, from these three highlighted numbers here is when I shut down business referrals, okay, in the high skill market, actually across all markets, there's a moderate loss in average annual earnings. But somewhat surprisingly, you know, and, and this is where I think it really highlights why models are, are helpful, right? If I just showed you those first regressions about uh, what's the effect of a business referral on a wage, you saw that people who use business referrals look like they have very high wages. So you might say business referrals must generate, must be a huge effect on, on wages. And if I took it away, it must be a huge effect. Turns out through the lens of the model, actually, it's not the case that these good workers in high skill markets actually have also very high arrival rates through other channels as well. And therefore, actually, you take away their business context, they move a little bit less, but their wages aren't incre uh, incredibly affected. However, you take away the family and friends network, and it absolutely crushes low, uh, low ability workers, and in particularly low ability workers in low skill jobs. So according to this kind of factor, now, of course, there's a massive Lucas, Lucas critique, which anybody here could throw at us, which is, you know, you take away someone's network of family and friends, maybe they, you know, they try to use other channels. Of course, that's true. But, it, you know, it, it's nice. I mean, you know, so, so my understanding, for example, of, of, the, of the literature that thinks about uh, mobility across uh, geographic locations, uh, papers like Kennan and Walker and others, is that you always need to basically infer huge costs of moving across, across locations in order to understand people's mobility patterns. So that's a little bit of a puzzle. Well, so maybe, maybe this is telling you something about that. Maybe this is telling you that the reason that, that, that a plumber in, in uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania doesn't move to a different town uh, is because it would have a huge impact on his wages that's not going to be picked up by a model that simply tries to estimate search frictions across the two towns, thinking that every worker that is part of that town faces the same search friction. Okay, we do some other stuff as well. Uh, let me just take one minute to conclude. So, we explored the use of referrals in, this, in the US using this new data. It had a couple of features that allowed us to, to go a bit further than what's been done in, uh, in some of the existing empirical literature. It has some drawbacks too, as, as Manolis and others pointed out. We documented a couple of new facts that I, I agree that, that, that it would be good to have a panel of workers. It would be good to have more, more data on the firm. I, I don't see the patterns that we document being uh, necessarily reversed uh, by any of that. We developed a tractable model that incorporated these multiple channels into an otherwise standard model. We use the calibrated model to, to quantify the contribution of referrals to a bunch of different things. So I should stop there because I'm a couple minutes over. Uh, thanks, Ben, for the great presentation. Now, uh, officially, we are going to start our Q&A session. So among the panelists, uh, if you have any question, uh, 
you can uh, continue uh, discussing as usual. And if anyone among the attendees have a question, please raise your hand and I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to let you ask your question. So Ben, um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So I think here in, in one way you highlight um, one benefit of referrals, at least for low skill and um, this unobserved um, low guys, uh, which is that essentially they speed up uh, meeting. Mm -hmm. So when you take it away, they basically they lose, uh, they're, they're unemployed much more. Um, now, w was it true also that you get you have a channel for better match quality. So this is something I missed perhaps. That, so no, no, I skipped it. I skipped it. So something, and this is kind of preliminary. I don't want to take these, I don't want you to take these numbers too seriously because they literally came about in the last couple of days. But, but we're able actually to do the kind of exercise which I think you have in mind, mm -hmm. which is suppose I take a type one, a low type, mm -hmm. how much of his earnings am I getting because of the meeting speed and how much am I getting because of the better match quality? Um, no, so actually, yeah. Oh, okay. so, so suppose now that you were to take, you know, a fixed type and then uh, you, when that guy meets with a firm, uh, mm -hmm. he draws from the other distribution. Uh, of no, that's exactly what I just said. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yes. So, okay. so, so, so look at this matching function here, right? There's, there's the lambda, that's the speed, and the hj is the distribution. Yes, yes. okay, yes. So exactly. what I can do is I can give a1, I can give him I did. I think I did just the opposite of what you wanted to see here, but 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 it's easy enough to do it either way. I can give type one, type two's meeting speed, or I can give type one, type two's match quality, and I can do it across channel. So J is the channel, right? J is the channel. Right. So what I have in mind is so so what is the value of a particular channel? So um, so then um, for the match quality draw the H sub J um, X given A. Mm -hmm. So um, so for the business referral, say, change the J from B to O. That will give you a sense of if a business referral now only gives you the advantage of a faster matching potentially, faster meeting potentially, mm -hmm. but it does not give you the estimator or the calibrated advantage of better match quality. How big is that effect? And similarly for the other types. Oh, I see. So, okay. So what I was doing is saying, suppose I gave type one, type two's match quality through this. You want me to say, suppose I give, I say, okay, yeah, that's a nice other decomposition. I give you the speed of one, but the match quality that comes through a different channel. Okay. Yeah, we could do that. That would be interesting. The idea is to see what is the effect of these different channels, you know, on the, on the speed of meeting, uh, you know, you, you had a nice decomposition. On the match quality, that's the part that I didn't quite see. And okay, and just to make sure here, um, so the reason why is um, so um, the low skill types, or I guess the the less than high school or, or something, uh, sorry, less than college, they seem to find their jobs much more much faster, uh, to much greater extent through these referrals. It seemed to me from your discussion that this. Wait, wait, hold on. Say that again. Sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Okay, so I misspoke. Don't, so don't, don't in, in just don't confuse part, one thing. There's skill and there's ability, and I don't want to confuse this. So skill right, right, is, okay. is education, and ability we don't observe. Right. Okay. And now, so actually, I, to be honest, I, I didn't want to speak about either of those uh, in your okay. first graph. <laughs> right, in your first graph, in the jobs, um, right, in the low jobs by that measure of by that sociology measure, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you got a lot of. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, exactly this one. On the left-hand side, so the referrals from family and friends, um, so there is a lot of those referrals. They're, they're, they're like twice as high as a fraction than they are for the uh, sort of the... Uh, yeah, in the high school, yeah. Measure, right? um, so I was wondering here whether in addition to this, this uh, speed of meeting, which, which might be one reason why, why that actually happens, uh, whether there is some ability, um, I don't know, a different level perhaps. Uh, so, okay, so here maybe. Okay, mean, so, sorry. What it's ability not means control. in this market could be different? Is that the idea? Sorry? I didn't understand the question, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. So, so I think that, that the composition that I asked before, I think would be, would be helpful for understanding uh, this picture a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, okay. That's all. Yeah. Sorry. That's it. Ben, I had a quick question on the, the, 
the, the link between the theory and the and the data. So so you you said that you know in the mall when you remove uh, business referrals, it um, you know the effect on on earnings is is mitigated relative to what the reduced form coefficients would would, would tell you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting. It, but I was I was wondering how you know the how the ingredients that you put in the mall affect that uh, conclusion in the sense that in the mall there's no sense in which you know business referral referrals help you solve an, an information problem and lead to you know some changes in 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 the in the output technology and so in some sense if you added that channel uh, to your mall maybe you know that that comparison between the counterfactual and the mall and the data would change and my intuition would be that it would you know, actually bring the, the the model estimate of that earnings loss closer to what the data has uh, tells you. So I was wondering whether, you know, it was possible to add that to the model. And if so, what would be the type of variation in the data that would let you, you know, disentangle uh, what you have now in the model from this additional uh, channel? Yeah, so, so, so let me answer that in a couple of different parts. First, you know, I, I just want to be clear about one thing that that the model is consistent with the wage differentials in the regressions, right? No, I understand, but that yeah. you know that yeah, okay. would be you know you, you you're loading everything in one particular. Yeah. Uh, now the yeah, other channel. thing that 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 I found that was kind of interesting uh, is is this picture here that that is telling you so so to be completely honest with you, what I thought was that I expected this large differential in business between the two abilities, but I did not necessarily expect the same thing to come from the formal channels. Okay, and so for example. You know, one thing that you could think of as ability in a very reduced form sense is literally high ability guys. It's not about match quality. It's just that they have a bigger business network. And so you went to Harvard business. I can't make Harvard jokes. You work there now, but you went to Harvard business school and, and you have a, a great collection of friends now and, and they help you get jobs. But one of the interesting things that I see potentially as a challenge, as we try to think more about writing in future papers, writing down micro foundations, is that what this picture here tells me is that if business referrals are somehow highly sensitive to ability, which to me suggests that they're playing an important informational role, then the same seems to be true for other as well. So now I have to think about what happens in the formal market. Maybe there are interviews or other signals that are being used that are high, also highly informative about underlying ability. And that to me, I mean, I, I know what you, I, I agree with what you're saying. We wanna understand sort of the underlying mechanisms better and those could potentially change uh, those decompositions. I, I completely agree, I'm not gonna argue against that. But it's, I, I think it's not, it's actually not as straightforward to put it all together as I thought it might be originally. Uh, can I ask a, a clarification to both sure. Ben and Adrian from someone who's not in the literature? So what are the information channels we have in mind that are not already captured by either the search friction or the fact that those uh, draws of uh, match quality depend on ability? Yeah, so, okay, so there's the, the literature kind of, it goes in two different directions. I mentioned one, which, is, which was the Jovanovic style, yeah, that somehow uh, match-specific productivity is unknown to both the worker and the firm, but if, if I mean, the way these model, this is like the Dustman paper that, that, that Manolis had mentioned earlier. If the referral comes through a business contact, for example, or ref, if, if you just get referred, then the match specific productivity is drawn from a different distribution, typically one with a smaller variance. So it's, you have more information, but there the asymmetric information is, is uh, sorry, the incomplete information is symmetric in the sense that the worker and the firm, neither one knows how good the match is. Then there, there's a pa famous paper by Montgomery and a long literature that followed that posits the idea that, okay, uh, Pierre uh, works at UCLA and Pierre is good. Uh, good people tend to be associated with other good people, this idea of homophily, so that a randomly selected uh, member of Pierre's network is better than a randomly selected person from the, uh, from the population uh, and so in that sense, it, it's more of, a, of, of an adverse selection story uh, that, that referrals can reduce adverse selection by changing the distribution over lemons and, and good workers uh, that come through. Did that answer your question? 
yes. Oh. Okay. But I, I was thought naively that, all right, that would show up like a, as a higher search intensity perhaps. For, That I, I'm, I'm guessing all the counterfactual are, are going to be different, right? But uh, um, yeah. yeah, but but I mean, in some sense, some of this is being captured, right, by the fact mm -hmm. that that there's different. I mean, the way those what do those models ultimately generate? What what like for example, the Jovanovic model, basically, you know, people who use that model essentially generates a different H uh, for people who come through a different distribution of X for people who come through referrals. So some of that is being captured here. But the, of course, I mean, that's why I, I, I say we're wide open to the Lucas critique here uh, in the sense that, you know, if people change their behavior, if, uh, if firms stop using one of these channels, of course, then, you know. But that's why I thought that the counterfactual that I was kind of highlighting was maybe a good one. I mean, in the sense that, uh, you know, when my wife moved to London, Ontario from New York City and tried to get a job uh, as a teacher uh, in London, she, she had no friendly and friends there. Um, and she didn't have much choice about it. And, and that's, you know, something that helped her, you know, get her first job uh, in New York. And, you know, three years later in London, Ontario, she was still a substitute teacher. So. We have a couple of questions from uh, attendees. So okay. Carlos Carrillo Tudela, I'm gonna uh, unmute you and you can ask your question, Carlos. Hi, can you hear me? Carlos, hi. Hey, how are you? Nice paper. Thanks. I guess you should ask your question. I wanted to just see how you're doing, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, cannot, I cannot see you, but I don't know how to turn on my camera right here. Anyhow. That's okay. Uh, um, so I was wondering how much, uh, and maybe there's a very simple answer to this, how much the business referrals are just because these guys live on a market that uh, requires you to ask for reference letters and you know some of them do specifically require that you ask uh, uh, for business oh, sorry reference letters from previous employers so it's kind of mechanical because of the structure of them of, of the labor market they, they live in this high skilled labor market while the low skill labor markets is just less screening and well you know um, the boss needs somebody to clean the toilets and ask yeah. the employees, hey, do, you, do you mind bringing somebody that is reliable, can show up, which is just the skills that you need because everybody can clean the toilet and that's it. And so, so I'm just wondering how, how is that really affecting this results? No, this, this, is, this is a great question. So, so, so that, I mean, you know, the honest answer is, you know, how, how much we can control for this is a bit limited. So mm -hmm. we, were, we were comforted by the fact that all of those regression results I showed you are true even when we control for the different occupation codes, okay? So then if you're having, you know, variation that a particular occupation tends to use referrals intensely and another one with a similar skill index doesn't, then, then that should give us a little bit of a clue there. We, we didn't see that. Um, the other thing that you mentioned that I thought was super interesting is you know, so one of the one of the theories out there, there's a, a, a very nice paper uh, by Rachel Heath who came out in the JP, this was her job market paper, that has data from um, Bangladeshi uh, garment workers. And the theory there was exactly the kind of moral hazard story you have in mind. It's a low skill occupation. And yet the theory is, if your dad helps you get a job at my garment factory, then you're really not gonna mess around because I can punish you and your dad. So you would expect then that uh, to see really good matches formed by people where the dad helps them get the match. And so then you would, but, but then you would expect, I thought to see higher wages amongst people referred through family and friends if the moral hazard story was super important. And that's an example of something where at least in our data set, I mean, this is from the US, her, her, her data set is very different. So the frictions might be different, but at least in our data, we don't find super strong support for that moral hazard story. However, you have um, longer tenures, which you have longer tenures, which which clearly goes in that direction. You don't want to, you know, screw the the reputation. I agree, but dad. I guess, but but I, I'm still a little puzzled by the wage because if if, mm -hmm. if I'm a if I own the factory, uh, who do I want to pay a, 
a higher wage to the worker who comes with some guarantee that uh, that they're going to work hard, and 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 on top of that, a guarantee, not a guarantee, but in all likelihood, they're not going to be uh, leaving me very fast. Uh, yeah, so, right? I, I so wonder- the quality of that match should be higher. Yes, and and their wage should be higher, but we don't. So that's something do, we don't do. you have some with. sense of amenities? Because obviously when you exactly, yeah. so, b- so bundle the two together, you care about expected value, which then reduces your quit probability later on. Yeah, so seems we to literally, I think this might be the only data set I know of actually mm. uh, that says things like how satisfied would you say you are with other aspects of the job, benefits, maternity leave, flexibility and work hours, right. stuff like that. And that's this other column here. And if anything, I mean, it's basically insignificant, but if anything's negative uh, for referrals through family and friends. Nice. I, should also, I also want to just say one thing about the, the referrals. I think it's fairly unlikely here that this is coming. Well, like I can say it's not coming from just asking for a letter because the question that we're using asks about how you found out about your current job. Right. So if you just find out on your own and then ask somebody else for a letter, that's not going to show up here. So it's not just people writing letters for you. If that's the only thing they're doing. Right. No, thanks. That, that makes sense. I mean, um, we're looking at actually a very similar uh, uh, type of type of things, but from the firm side, and we're finding very complementary uh, so, uh, 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 conclusions to, to what you're getting. So I just wanted to know a little bit more of that. Okay. Thanks. We have another question uh, from Pavel uh, Krolikovsky. Pavel, now you are unmuted. Yes, uh, hello, Pavel Krolikovsky here, Cleveland Fed. I just had one question about the data. So you probably know that people have used the PSID in the past a lot to sort of study this referral stuff. Um, I was wondering if those questions still exist in the PSID or obviously help you with the panel dimension and, and the sort of right sense of tenure. Um, but I don't know if they have this distinction between family and friends and, and business contacts. Thank you. So David, we looked a little, no, sorry. I'm going to have David come on again. We look, we started this project like 10 years ago or something like that, but what were we looking at the NLSY. Oh, we were looking at the NLSY and in the 82 and 83, I think, cohorts, they asked a lot about, they asked some questions about referrals. Um, and in fact, I mean, it's kind of funny, the, 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 the first picture that we thought was kind of interesting was we saw a U-shape in referrals in this NPB score using that NLSY, mm-hmm. which we thought was kind of interesting. It looked like it was being used a lot at high and low skill jobs, and we were trying to figure out what to make of that. And, and then when we got the better data with Giorgio, we figured out why there was a U-shape. Um, I didn't, really, okay. I don't think I knew that the PSID asked about the channel. Yeah, they have. Issue. Yeah, they, they have. They had some questions. Again, it might not have been for a very long time, but they definitely had them and people have used them in the past. I know papers from the 80s that, that have used those questions, oh, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. I've used those questions more recently as well. But anyways, I'll, I'll leave it at yeah. that. Take a look. I, I, yeah, we have to take a look, but I don't think they ask about the specific channel, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I, I remember those papers from the 80s, but yeah, we'll, we'll take a look. Is this okay. like the Holzer or anything? Okay, we, yeah, we should look. 